Hey everybody, this is your brother, Narda Michael Walden. Welcome to All In, my podcast where we break down music, life, and love, interviews, and conversations. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, today we'll be speaking about songwriting. Songwriting is a very in touch with God, emotion, feeling, flow. And for me, there's no just one way of doing it, but I love to have a title and think about the chorus. Think about the part that I want the whole world to sing. If I can establish that first, then I can get into a verse and a bridge and whatever else. But I always like to start with a title, a direction, a feeling of what is that chorus. Like if, if I'm a comedian, what's the punchline? I start from the punchline backward into the joke. So I, I start with the hook back into the song. Now, if someone brings me a song, I'm always laying, is the hook strong enough? Because I know with that strong chorus, you can change a person's life. So in songwriting, I just want to inspire everyone who's thinking about songwriting, is your chorus strong? I know Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, they'll land for that strong chorus. Babyface, Quincy Jones, Prince, the land for that strong chorus. So God bless you in your pursuits of songwriting. Follow your heart, follow your dream, but a strong chorus can change your life. And speaking about titles of songs, I'm really open to my imagination's flow, meaning I try to challenge my imagination. If I have a title or someone gives me a title, I think it's maybe not so commercial, I think no. Uh, Dua Lipa, Dua Lipa, or my girl uh, Dojo Cat, they might have a hit with that title. So I challenge myself, how would I have a hit with that title? I challenge myself to think outside the realm of what I think is commercial, how someone else could have a hit with it. So that's what I try and do. I really put my mind on outside the box and make the music, make the melody so infectious that it takes an outside word into an inside smash. Who's the one who? What did that mean? For Aretha. She wasn't even thinking she was writing a song, but I was thinking, who's the one who? Then, you know, and he thinks he's got me, but the fish jumps off the hook. But we, we made that, that, that music so cool with her. So I'm often open to words, how the words feel, whatever it is, but make that music and that beat just so strong. That's like a stadium, rocking a stadium. For example, Preston Glass had a great idea, great song idea. He said, we don't have to take our clothes off. We don't have to take our clothes off. It's like, wow. We don't have to take our clothes off to have a good time. Well, we can dance and party all night, drink some cherry wine. Like, wow, that's so interesting for these kids and everybody to be singing that kind of thing. So that was very unusual. There's a song called Freeway of Love. It became a big hit for Aretha, but maybe no one knows what that's really about until you hear what we're talking about. But even in that, you can interpret it different ways. That's the power of a song, too. Bob Dylan taught us. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to have the listener look at it my way. I want them to see it how they want to see it, which I often like. Some people think Freeway of Love is about driving a car. Other people think it's about having sex. It's about all kinds of stuff to people. So you know what? It's all good. As long as they listen to the song, they enjoy the song, they buy the song, I really don't care how they look at it. I'm just trying to write a strong, infectious chorus. I'm very inspired by music. I love what melody does to us. And I love music of the 50s, like Bangles, Bobbles, and Beads, like Old Cape Cod by Patti Page, even Johnny Mathis, Chances Are. I love great classic music. A uh, theme from a summer place by per Percy, Percy Faith Orchestra. I just love great melody. So in my life, I'm a, I'm a student of Burt Backrack and Hal David, early Dan Warwick music. I'm a student of Laura Nero, Eli and 13th Confession, New York Tenderbury albums. I'm a student of James Taylor, of Joni Mitchell. I'm a student of all the Holland Ocean Holland music. I'm a student of the great genius Smokey Robinson, how he took and gave a career to Mary Wells, my guy. And then uh, Two Lovers, 
and then flipped, flipped around and wrote a smash for the Temptations, my girl, and produced and wrote it. So he was just on fire with all these new ideas for a new sound, for a new uh, chapter of people coming out of Detroit, Michigan, having massive careers because of his imagination. Marvin Gaye, the whole What's Going On album. It was so potent, they wouldn't even put it out for two years. But when Marvin's brother came back home from Vietnam and really inspired Marvin what was going on in Vietnam, Barry Gordy realized, I have to put this out. And then they did. And it was like the healing music from my Uncle Travis who came back from Vietnam. All the soldiers came back from Vietnam. What's Going On album was the healing music. Everywhere you go, that's the music you heard. Like the Bible, everywhere you go. So music is really powerful. More than anything I've experienced is the healing capacity of music and how it relaxes people. At a party, at a function, at, at, a, at a basement dance, at an outside dance. The music is everything. I remember the way I felt at this outdoor nighttime tennis court on the north side of Kalamazoo with all the black kids dancing on the tennis court. And they just released this new song by the Four Tops called Baby I Need You Lovin'. And it was a big deal. They said, we got the brand new song by the Four Tops. And they were kind of like a new group at the time. It's called Baby I Need You Lovin'. And on it came, and the chord changes were so haunting. It just so like made you want to cry. And see all these, all these black kids dancing this song, but the chords were like sad, just sad and longing. And then I saw the girl I really liked named Penny. She was dancing with this older guy, and then he kissed her, and that song was going. It's like, damn, what a powerful song. So that's how I feel about music. It just cuts me like a damn knife. And I've always been like that. Music is very deep to me. I know it's deep to everybody, really. My way of songwriting might be completely backwards for you. Because I go at it attacking a chorus. I go at it attacking what I think could be the biggest part of the song first. Then I don't mind going to how we want to get there. You know, I don't mind to give Jeff Racone a free of love, you know, in the pink Cadillac, and he comes in the line, wins against my back. And I don't mind that he wants to go into his verse how he wants to weave the verse, that's fine. How he want to weave the verse is fine. It's more about that chorus. When I get there, will I be like satisfied? So I'm more nervous, worried, praying, hoping. Can I have a strong chorus that the world will like? That's what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do. Like a knockout punch, pow, that's me. In your case, do what's best for you. If, if writing the verse and get a cool thing first and then you have the faith, it's gonna lead you to, you know, to the promised land, and ah ha ha, there it is, your beautiful chorus, fine, as long as you get there. Because I'm telling you, man, music has the power to take us from poverty overnight to success. Who was Dojo Cat two years ago? I don't know. She sure is fine, very talented, singing, rapping, carrying on, but the sound that came with her and that beautiful chorus that came with her, unique. Who was Lizzo a couple years ago? Nobody. Bam, Lizzo's here. See the power of the music. The power of that course, the power of what's going on, it's, it's, it's staggering. It's staggering. So God bless you in your songwriting adventures. Have fun. Don't forget what Lou Rawls taught us. It's supposed to be fun. But never underestimate the power of the course. It can change your life over and over and over again. Whitney Houston needed How Will I Know. She needed I Want to Ask Somebody Loves Me. She needed the song that Clyde Davis found called So Emotional. I remember the day Clyde gave me the song. He said, take this song. I think it can be the number one record. I said, okay, and I went and played, heard him play this song called So Emotional. It was okay demo, but I got what he got. I got that he knew if we took it and put metal pipes banging and beating and like tribes of people going crazy and the new sound that we're gonna put on it with that beautiful melody it had, I get so emotional, baby. Every time I think of you, I get so emotional, baby. Ain't it shocking what? Love can do. I got what he was saying. If we could take that kind of melody and make it beat, boom, the pop, boom, the pop, boom, the pop, boom, 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 boom. It could like be damn the number one record. And you know what? After I cut it, put a vocal on it, and Mick Jagger would happen to be in the studio when I was cutting her vocal in New York. He wanted to come and hear it. He was dancing around with Whitney on the playback of So Emotional. I got it together, went to Clive's office the next day in New York, and played it to him and stood by his desk so he watched his reaction, brought back his idea, his vision, 
and it was a smash. That's so emotional. But it had a new sound. Strong chorus. So, I love music. I love you. God bless you and all your endeavors. Study the great people. Study Smokey Robinson, how he did it. Study everybody. It's wonderful. To be more specific, in my case, I am a singer in that I like to sing, go to a keyboard, have a little drum groove if I have, but if I don't have a drum groove, it's okay too, just a piano. The sound of the piano, the sound of a keyboard, and a vocal idea, hearing a melody, kind of hearing that, singing it, can bring to me uh, my heart to open. And if my heart open, then I can try to identify from the higher world the music that wants to come on down. Let it come on down through my heart. Let my heart channel that higher music. And in channeling the higher music, I'm trying to weed out what I feel out of that higher music. Is that chorus that's trying to come down? That chorus, again, what's that part we can all latch on to? So that's what I'm trying to always do. By, by singing, and I, and I encourage like Justice Dobrin, my other partner. I said, sing, Justice. Don't just play, don't just play keyboard. Open your heart chakra. Sing. By your singing, you can identify what the people are gonna sing. If you're not doing that, then you're, you're missing a big, a big hookup. But if you can sing as a songwriter, you're halfway there or more. So I encourage you to sing. Find what you want the people to sing, because you're singing it. Even if you're not a great singer. Look at Rod Temperton. Wrote all those smashes for Heat Wave. All those smashes for Michael Jackson. He was a great singer, but he's humming the melodies. He's singing the melodies. So it's really, really critical, to, I think, to open your heart chakra and use your voice. Use your voice. Use your voice. What you want people to sing, you sing. Identify it. Hear it. Hear it. Work on it. What I'll say is, if I have even an iota of a title, any kind of thought, or if I'm searching immediately, that little, that little inkling of a title gives me some kind of direction to like write around that. And out of that can come the melody, which I might just scat. We'll find a lyric for it later. That's okay. But I'm writing about a title. I'm writing about a direction that I can kind of fill in. The emotion. For me, that's critical in writing a hit song. Because I am thinking about a hit song. It's not some like freaky thing I'm like, I'm not thinking about. No, I'm thinking. I want to have a hit song. <laughs> so if I want to have a hit song, I'm thinking, what can I take? Some idea, some, some phrase, some inspirational quote, and weave it into a smash. So that's what I'm really doing. If I don't even write all the words at that, at that setting, and I'll sketch it, and I'll get my phone. Or if Jimmy's got the, got, the, got the machines running, I want to record it. I want to capture it. So I can sit down later with my writers, lyric writer, or myself, and fill in the blanks of what, I'm, what those syllables are saying, what that phrasing's saying. Inside that scat is the smash. And I pay critical attention to the blueprint of what comes out. That phrasing... In there are the words, if you just claw it enough, in there are the words to bring out, to become the hit. If I'm writing for Jeff Beck, like Wired, then my left hand of the piano becomes the bass line. My right hand becomes the chord changes, becomes the chords, and the rhythm of the chords. Then my mouth becomes what I want Jeff to play. So I'm singing Jeff's lines to him, his melody. If I'm working with Neil Sean on the Universe album over here, I'm the same process. My left hand and my bass, my right hand has all the chord changes, rhythms, but then what I sing to Neil is the melodic uh, melody I need him to learn and play. So yes, it's very, very similar. I'm also conscious of even instrumental music does have a chorus. On a song like I Love Your Smile, I love your smile, Shanice Wilson in the same room came in here and I said, give me seven song titles, and she did. I hate to be lonely, people in the world, I love your smile, she wrote seven song titles, and I sat on my keyboard, and, and God blessed me. All seven of those things came within the first hour. Just, I heard, I look at the title, I could hear what the, what the chorus should be, bang out a little thing on the keyboard, have her sing it, tape a little smidge, a little snippet of it. Get to I Love Your Smile. I love your smile, do 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 It came to me like that, do 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 I love your smile. That just came to me, and it's so clear it came that I can't even tell you today where those chords are. If I go to the piano now and try to figure out those songs, I have to fumble around to find those chords. They were like a magic solution that came as a gift from God almost for Shanice. It was God's way of loving Shanice. Tips I'd like to share 
I study. I'm a constant student of radio and what's happening and things I love and marrying the two. For example, I want to listen to what Bruno Mars is up to. I want to hear what Silk Sonic's up to. I want to hear what Justin Timberlake, people who I love of the day, are up to. It's very important to know what the top ten is. At the same time, I'll go and buy for Jackson Allen, I love right, Jimi Hendrix in 1970, and play that to him and say, how can we incorporate what Hendrix is doing in 1970 into now? I always love that juxtaposition of rock meets funk, of funk meets rock, of pop meets soul meets rock. Those worlds of mixing it up like a gumbo. I love that because it's intriguing. And then you can smash people's intentions with all these different sounds they aren't used to hearing, the combinations of such you're not really used to hearing. I like mixing it like that. It's a powerful thing when you start mixing classical with rock and funk. Mix it all together. It's kind of it makes a wild combination of a sound. For me, I, it turns me on. I'm always inspired by music I've heard, taking inspiration from music I've heard, music I love, um, and either redoing it, which I love doing, like I'm Every Woman was a remake. I love doing remakes. Even that song on my new album of Come Saturday Morning by the Sandpipers, love it. So I am inspired by classic music and how to remake it where it's intriguing all over again. I, I, I am turned on by that. I am turned on by all music. I am. But I'm always 100% on the page of what I can write now, what I can c compose now, or from last night what I composed. I can take and flip and get in the studio and blow up. That's, that usually turns me on the most because I want to be a writer. I love publishing. I love publishing. <laughs> As a writer, it's important. I get publishing. We make things happen. That's what keeps, keeps the lights on. I mean, you cover other people's music, that's cool. We made money doing that. But also, when you write something, that's, that's your, your bread and butter. Drumming is so critical anymore, and it's become more and more that way. I came on the scene in 1974 with Mavish Orchestra, and then I, drumming kept progressing and progressing as far as pop music and rhythm aspect and phrasing and Sly and the Family Stone, what they brought to it. And, uh, and when dance music kicked off in disco and Michael Jackson, Madonna, all of it, Nile Rodgers, we all came pushing it, pushing it, pushing. Now around the world, it's black. It's black, black rhythm, black music, black groove, the groove. We all want to feel it. So to go to a drum machine and program something first, ideal. To get a cool groove first, and then find the right melody, find the right chord to go in that drum groove, cool. Because the rhythm is so, is so critical anymore. It didn't used to be that way, but now it is. Now you can have just a cool beat, and that'd be the smash. You know, just a simple thing. Of course, Zeppelin had a cool song like that too. Yeah. I encourage everyone to play drums. I encourage Dylan Sean to play drums. Raymond Gomez does play drums. Phenomenal. Jan Hammer does play drums. Phenomenal. And I have so many new drummers who are, I'm admiring. This Eric Moore guy is phenomenal. I have a new fan out of the UK, Andy Edwards is brilliant. A new fan on the East Coast who's got Mavish Orchestra Project. You can play all the Mavish Orchestra stuff. Greg Bendian. There's so many genius drummers now. When I came up, there were the great jazz guys, a few rock guys, but there weren't a ton of guys. Now, I'm scared to even watch YouTube. There's so much stuff out there that little girls are playing and it's killing it. Little boys are playing, little everybody are playing and killing it. Because they can watch and see the masters of what we put down, what people put down. They can just assimilate by watching YouTube now. And they make headway of progress on guitars, on basses, on keyboards, on singing, on everything now. So I'm really impressed with people and their hunger for education and music growth. I'm seeing a lot of growth in music in every field. If you love jazz, there are kids playing phenomenal jazz now. So, when I came up, it wasn't like that. But now it is. All over the world. All over the world. 
what I want to say about left brain, right brain. The song is a baby. God gives us a baby. The baby comes. Baby comes out. It's got blood on it and a umbilical cord. We got to chop the umbilical cord and wash the blood off. See if it's a boy or a girl. Dress it up. And Quincy Jones taught me a very important thing, and I'll share it with you all. Quincy Jones said, do not strangle the baby in the crib. Do not strangle the baby in the crib. What that means is love your babies. Wash the blood off, cut their umbilical cords, dress them up, and love your babies as a song. Find the love in the song. Then, left side, right side of the brain, the producer in you can come in. And how do we want to produce this, this baby, this song for the, for the world? How we want to dress it? How we want to make it stand up strong and tall for the world? That's a whole other headspace. But first you got to have a love for the baby. Love for the baby. But many times it's happened that maybe I think, well, is the baby strong enough? But then when you put on your producer hat and you make everything sound in tune, Make everything sound cool. Make everything lock in with the drum machines or whatever it's going to be or beat detectives or and bass lines and chords. You can have a strong baby now. Production's a hell of a thing. How can take this baby that you wash the blood off and cut the thing into a monster smash for the world? So don't sneeze at that production. Don't sneeze at any of it. Take it all serious. And love is straight on through. Love is straight on through. Love your babies and love what you can do with productions. I do. Production process, I could say to you, I have one, but I really don't. I have one in my heart of hearts when I know I want to achieve a good feeling. A good feeling on tape or on Pro Tool or in, in, in the playback of a song. But... How it happens, how we do it, it changes every time. Which I think is part of God's mystery to me. Part of God's mystery probably to a lot of songwriters and producers. You don't know how it's going to come. But you, you just stay open and humble and worthy. Try to stay worthy of it, humble of it, and, and, and gratiating of it. So when it comes, you're, you can recognize it and capture it and put it on the pro tool, on the tape, whenever you're going to be working. But there is no one way of doing it. I will say, I will say the spirit of being open is really important. The spirit of being welcoming is important so that whatever the spirit's going to bring, we can welcome it. And out of that feeling, I'm, I'm open, I'm willing, I'm willing, can come a great thing or another that we can then produce into its Himalayan mountain size. Like I'm a fan of what Phil Spector did back in the old day, you know, Lost Love and Feeling, the massive production style they got into, the wall of sound they called it. We still love the big sound, but it starts humbly from the spirit giving you this idea. I say stay open to all of it. Don't feel like you have to have this way or that way. Don't have to be a cookie cutter. If you are, fine. But in my case, I'm open to the spirit flowing, getting to the keyboard, Identifying it right away, record it, that little idea, that little thing. Then, how we can blow it up, what we need to do. You got a drum machine, no drum machine, you got a room machine, no room, no, you got a bass, give me the bass. You got a thing, you got a thing, whatever we got, just build it, grow it. Have faith something great's gonna happen. Have faith something great's gonna happen. Also, identify right away on a vocal mic what the idea is you want the singer to sing, what the idea is, what the song is. Always keep the song in the room. How important are the current trends and production styles? Vary because music changes all the time. And you can say, maybe every 20 years, it comes back around again. True, but guess what? During those 20 years, you gotta go with it. Every bit of it. Hand claps are in, hand claps are out. High snares are in, low snares are in. Big bass rooms are in, soft bass rooms are in. Busy bass lines are in. One note bass drum, boo. One note bass lines, boo, 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 boo. You know, my man from Motown out right now. But he's coming back in because now, guess what? Silk Sonic brought it back in. So you got to be, I think, attuned to what's happening in music to know what you can get away with as a producer and feel proud about that this is going to be a next big hit. I think it's important. If I'm honest right now, the music we make is so much about having the power and the muscle. I'm very much aware of that. 
And Jim, who I work with all the time, I say, is this as mighty as it can be? Is this as powerful and muscly as it can be? Because I want to be able to feel like it's competitive. It's competitive. It's competitive. Even a ballad is competitive. It's strong. I love producing tender, sensitive music, like Laura Neer music, beautiful music like we just did for this guy, Charlie Mitchell out of Australia, a song called Even After, really tender and sensitive. But where it climaxes like on the ending, like Bridge Over to a Water from Simon and Garfunkel, you have that great moment of the rush of love and strings. And I also love the opposite end of things where it's just banging hardcore from the very beginning. Big clanging drums, like we're doing with Journey right now. Big sound. Bobby Clement coming through with mixes. Jimmy cut him and put down some awesome stuff with Neil. So I really like it all. I'm challenged by it all and I love it all. But I have to say, the extreme, which shows the sensitivity, turns me on the most. Dynamics. I'm a student of music, I'm a student of everyone because I feel like I can learn from all the great music that's been out there. I'm a real music collector, albums collector, radio studier. I just listen to everything I can and I use it all for different songs. I may hear something by Stevie Wonder that I can use in a new artist I'm gonna be working on because Stevie gave us so much fodder, so much to draw from in his vocal stylings, in his rhythm sensibility, and in his idea and synthesizer use, drum use, everything. He inspired Prince. I also draw from Smokey Robinson, the beauty of his melodies and productions with Motown. All the, all the Motown stuff. I'm from Detroit or Kalamazoo, Michigan, not far from there. So I often draw from the Detroit sound. I often draw from Chicago, where my dad comes from, not far away, Curtis Mayfield sound. And out of that come Earthman and Fire. And so much. I love Burt Backrock and his passion for how he can just change up, do a measure of four, go to three, do what he wants to do with the music and keep it so elegant. Of course, we don't hear a lot of that nowadays, but it's in my heart. I'm often studying it. The current producers, I'm a fan of how they make everything sound so big and mighty. I don't want to name any, 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 any names right at the moment, but so much of top 10 music has got the bang on it that the kids love, people love. So I'm always intrigued by how it's put together. Most recently, there's a cat named Pitbull. Took our jam, We Don't Take Our Clothes Off, and made it called Party of a Lifetime. It'll be coming out shortly. Massive groove, massive groove. So I'm always enthralled by how the new cats are able to take what we did in disco era and make it Hot now, bigger, badder, stronger, more muscle, more muscle for the people now. It's quite, it's quite something. How are they able to achieve it? You even have to ask Jim. I heard Joel ask Jim one time, how do they make it so loud? It's a science, man. It is a science. So I'm trying to study it like everybody else. Learn it and grow some new hits for the future. I've had the best one-on-one -on -one mentors in the world. The first men mentor one-on-one -on -one with me was the Beatles producer himself, Sir George Martin. The first album I ever made is called Apocalypse with Mob Vishnu Orchestra. John McLaughlin, Mob Vishnu took me and us to London to make this album with the London Symphony with Michael Tyson Thomas conducting and George Martin producing with Jeff Emmerich engineering, the Beatle crew. And to watch him be so patient and so kind and loving with us and capture all that sound that we were making, which was massive, symphonic, with loud drums playing the funk, with Vishnu crying on the guitar, and Jean-Luc Ponte playing all these ripping riffs, and Ralph Armstrong bringing the Detroit bass, and Gail bringing this angelic keyboard and voice. Phenomenal. And he made us all feel so beautiful. And I learned that from him, how he made us feel. But one time I asked him, I said, I love how you phase Ringle cymbals. Can you phase my cymbals? He said, no. I've already done that. I won't do that for you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Okay. So I dropped that immediately. But what he was doing was capturing the natural sound I had 
It was phenomenal what he was doing. So he's my first person to ever really watch and study was George Martin. George Martin, um, I watched how he put this whole album together. If he had to record the strings first and then overed up our rhythm section into that, he would say, watch me. I'm gonna go stand by that window and I'm gonna conduct through the window the timing, if there's a space, and will you come back in again? So for example, the string play. Space, 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 two, 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 three, two, three, two, 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 three. He would count me through the window where I was to come back in according to him because he would say, when we record the strings, their timing kind of slowed down from where your timing might be. So I have to slow you down to match what we pre-recorded on the strings. So I'd be watching him count me and following him and trusting him. Things like that he was doing. Also, he was brilliant with Gail Moran. There's a song called Smile of the Beyond. He wanted her to sing the song. And he said, go in the vocal booth with the, these headphones, sing it through, and then we'll go and properly record it. And she said, fine. She went and sang the whole song through beautifully. He, and then she's, she's, she's now ready to record the song. He says, come in and listen back. That's it. So he completely fooled her thinking there'd be another take, but there was not. It was one take. So he took the pressure right off of her. Ralph Armstrong was 17 years old. He made Ralph Armstrong feel like a million dollars. He made Mahavishnu feel like a million dollars. He made everybody feel like a million dollars. And then if we want to ask about John Lennon or Paul McCartney or inside Beatle things, he tells everything. He's very forthcoming. We have a dinner together. He tells you anything he wanted to know. Also, it's very nice to be right there on Oxford Street. The studio, London, London Air Studio, was right on the corner of Oxford, whatever it was, up the stairs in this big, massive studio. But just down the stairs on the street were all the English taxi cabs and buses and people just walking and doing their thing. So you really felt in the heart of London making that kind of a recording in 74. Then you got Vishnu, Ma Vishnu, the genius, always trying to inspire me. We had some downtime. Halfway through making the album, he says, Michael, I was Michael then. He says, come with me. I said, okay. We go down the street. He takes me to a movie theater. We go and see a movie called A Day in the Life of Even Desnovich. And I'm watching this movie, and in comes a helicopter flying in. And the helicopter flies in and then lands. And it lands into a concentration camp. And the concentration camp is a story of one day in the life of this man named Ivan Desnevich. And you see how terrible it is for one day in his life. Hardly any food, hardly anything at all, and just terrible conditions and terrible mind games they play. When we left that movie, I told Mavishnu how grateful I was that we were able to make this great recording, how grateful I was to be in London with him, how grateful I was that he chose me to play with him. And that's, I'm sure, what he wanted to feel from me after watching that kind of movie is a renewed sense of gratitude for what we were doing. My mom, Miss Pegg, taught me everything. She would say, be kind. She said, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. My mother was the best when it came to teaching how to be. It's my mother who taught me how to prepare for Aretha Franklin when Aretha would look at me with those eyes of fire, not to melt down, but how to be like integrous. Let her know I'm there to serve. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to fight you. That's my mom coming through. My dad and his side of the family with Grandma Nelly, his mother, they taught me production, perfection. When you went to Grandma Nelly's house, if you washed your hands, you had to reach below and get this little washcloth and wipe out the sink. There could be no beads in that sink. There could be no soap residue. It'd be absolutely clean. If you walk around our house, there'd be statues, beautiful statues. You get to respect everything, respect everything. So that kind of perfection of production in her home is in my music. I really want it to be like clean. I wanted the notes to be like bells in tune. So I've learned from my parents so much and my grandparents. But Grandpa Val was, a, was the top custodian of all columns in Michigan. He cleaned the buildings, we'd help him. 
he gave us rags, a wet rag and a, and a dry rag, to go and wipe the, the, the baseboards after they mop. Wipe the baseboards. Wash it and then dry it. But he'd come right back after us and do the same thing after us and make sure it was done right. No residue from mopping at all. Wiped and dried completely. If you had to clean the bathroom, he'd go behind you and make sure it was done completely. If you had to wipe out cigarettes out of the ashtray, he'd go behind and make sure it was done perfectly. Every ashtray, every trash can, everything done perfectly. If it was to wash a window, it was done perfectly. No streak, nothing like that. So it's all around me. I think God chose his family for me to be born into to understand work ethic and how to do things right and not, and not turn people off too much. And I want to say for drummers, all drummers realize a five-stroke role has to be played clean. And a seven-stroke role. And everything you do has to be played clean. So I thank my, my parents for that and let, let me play the drums and, and encourage me to play drums. It wasn't like, oh, you can't, make, you can't make all that noise. No, make the noise. My mom only got mad at me one time. I'd be in the basement practicing a song by The Who. I can see, I can see, I can see for miles and miles. I can see. And I decided to get mad at the guitar player because he wouldn't play the way I wanted him to play it. I'd go upstairs and get a glass of water. My mom would say, why are you, why are you shouting at those boys downstairs? I didn't realize I was shouting at the boys downstairs. I said, well, I'm just trying to get the song to get, to get right. You sound like you're shouting at the boys downstairs, you say to me. And someone I've ever heard her kind of get, you know, like, like that with me. But we sounded good. We got it together. So, mentors, music, my second album with Ken Scott, Vision of the Armor Beyond. Listen to those drums, the sounds he got. Damn, there's no better drum sound in the world than what Ken Scott got in Vision of the Armor Beyond. Incredible. Mentor, teacher, and how Ringo would use towels and sheets on his drums if he needed to. So, Garden Love Light, Tommy Dowd, the great producer for Aretha Franklin, the great producer for Ray Charles, all the Atlantic music of Almond Brothers coming through there. Here he is, the great master, Tommy Dowd, teaching us about compression with Dennis McKay. I flew in Dennis McKay to be the main engineer for Garden Love Light, but it was Tommy Dowd that taught him and taught me how to capture those huge sounds. I would say, Tommy, I want the snare to sound like a, like a Cadillac door sh slamming. <laughs> On White Knight. They got it. So I'm just letting you know, man, mentorship is all around. And it's been all around my life. Just such blessings. Ray Charles looking down at me right now. I remember with him. As a little kid, I carried in the snow his album, live in person, Ray Charles. And when I finally got to produce him, meet him, I was telling the story of how his album, Live in Person, changed my life. And I started singing. But I da 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 I wrote all that out by hand. And that's me playing the alto sax solo. And I just had to go and look up at the Himalaya mountain. There he is in all his majesty. I'm going, yes, Mr. Charles. And then he broke out laughing. And then we laughed. But he set me straight right away. Just remind me again what a genius he is. It's all around me. It mentors everybody. I learn from everybody. And I've also learned, don't say no to clients. Don't say no to artists. You can think you don't, don't, want, don't want to work with somebody. You think you don't want to. But when you meet the person, you go, oh, now I see why God brought you. Now I see why I'm meant to work with you. So never shut down. Stay open as a person. Meet people. And don't be too preconceived because guess what? I turned out Whitney, Whitney, Whitney Houston. It was Jerry Griffith that called and said, you have to take time out of your Aretha Franklin recession and do Whitney Houston. I said, I ain't got time. No, 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 no. You don't stand. I'm focused on Aretha Franklin. No, no, no. He said, no, you make time. This is Sissy Houston's daughter. You make time. So it was Jerry that did that. And the song was How Will I Know. And from there, then we grew and met and worked and did 20 songs together now and eight number ones together. So I really have to thank Jerry for stopping me in my tracks and making time. But I learned that lesson. People come to you, the phone call rings. Don't make it, don't shut it down. Meet, meet somebody. Go out of the way to meet somebody. Through that, you'll feel some love. And they bring their talent, and before you know it, history you can make. History. That's spirituality. Quincy Jones, 
the greatest mentor of my life as far as production that I actually got to become a friend with and hang out and talk to on a daily basis, not in the studio, just as a friend. He would say to me, we need more producers now, more helpers. He called it helpers. Helpers. And then I started working with Stacey Latizal, and I knew what he meant. Stacey was 11 years old. I told Henry Allen at Cotillion Records, why don't you let me produce four songs for Stacey? And if you like it, I can finish the album. If you don't like it, you haven't lost that much. I do four songs. But that was really because I think Quizzy Jones kind of inspired me. We need more helpers. We need more people to help out in production. That's why I reached out when I knew Henry Allen was trying to make a smash for Stacy, And I had just done I Should have Loved You, the Dance of Life album, and they were doing well with me. I said, well, why not Stacy? And then we did. We, we wrote Let Me Be Your Angel, Dynamite, Jump to the Beat, next album, Love on a Two-Year Street, Explosions. She started opening the shows for Michael Jackson, Jackson 5, out on the road with Jackson 5. That's how she was nothing to that. With T.M. Stevens playing bass and all these guys we put together for her is phenomenal. I started seeing the power of, of helping, as Quincy would call it. And what I learned from Quincy is love. Quincy's middle name is Delight. He brings delight to everything he does. He's got a, a way of bringing love to everything he does. And also I learned if he's in session, no matter who it is, right next to him are the current albums of the day. I looked down at his side, it would be Rufus, be anything that he thought was hot at that time so he could refer to it to make sure he was on the cutting edge. And also I watched him produce. I watched him produce Dave, Pat, Patty Austin. It was sound genius. But you say, yeah, it's really great. Maybe we just do it one more time. So he was a perfectionist as far as vocal takes. I heard from Michael Jackson also. He'd have Michael Jackson. Oh, that sounded really great. Let's just do it again. So I kind of learned that about Quincy to make sure you get enough things to choose from. Have a genius engineer with you because the engineer is your strength. Uh, he had within the genius Bruce Redeen. And Bruce's technique was this. He said, if you, if you leave me in here long enough, you give me enough time, you give me enough hours, I can make a hit. I can make a sound like what it needs to sound like. And he did every time. Then one album, the Thrill album, I heard was not sounding the way Michael Jackson wanted this sound, even after all was all mixed. They had to have a big conference about it. Went back and remixed the Thriller to sound more what Michael was looking for. Maybe in the drum toughness, stronger, whatever hell it was, I don't know. But they did. And that's when Quincy said that being a co-producer with Michael was a good thing. Because then they won all the Grammys, they won all the success with the biggest album in history. He was a co-producer with Michael. But Michael really grew. I remember seeing Michael in New York and shook his hand. He was in there filming The Wiz. And I was getting hot. I was already hot with my stuff and his just stays ladders on and stuff. He was looking at me like I might be a producer for him. But it was actually Quincy who was going to be the one to unlock the, the heavens for Michael Jackson. So I can't say enough about Quincy Jones and all the accolades, accolades he receives that are so beautiful. Because he's, he's our teacher for everybody. Look at Jerry Hay. Talk to Jerry Hay about Quincy Jones. Jerry Hay is a great horn arranger, a horn player, for all the stuff that Michael did with, with Quincy and all the other fire horns. That's all Jerry Hay in his writing. And Quincy inspired him so much. Look at Greg Fillingains, who Quincy took under his, under his arm. Steve first discovered Greg Fillingains out of Detroit, Michigan. I was there for his audition at SIR in New York when he was 18 years old. He was brilliant when he was 18 years old. But then later when he moved to LA, it was Quincy took Rec Filling Games, had him play boom, 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 ga -dum, ga -dum, ga -dum. all the bass lines and stuff. Would be, that would be, all be Greg. Filling Games is a monster. You can sing any song in the world. You can go to the piano and just play it. Not even trying to find the key. Play it. In the key you're singing. It's just a genius. So everyone around Quincy, from John Robinson, the great drummer, the most recorded cat, like, like a Steve Gadd, and all those hits of John, another phenomenal cat. I toured with, him, with John when he played with Shaka Khan on the tour with Brothers Johnson and my band. And I saw John every night play. And he is one of the baddest cats and strongest, like a basketball player playing the drums. Strong, driving, sweating, hitting. I was so surprised he was that powerful. But he is John Robinson. I'm inspired by so many, so many cats, but they're all in Quincy's world. Quincy understood that language in LA, get the very best of the cats and hone them, and he did. And all those albums he's putting together. So, I learned a lot from Quincy Jones, we all have. 
But I have learned also from everybody, to be honest about it. Carlos Santana's a great mentor. You see how passionate he is about getting whatever he wants. If he gets a sound on a video camera, and he wants that sound with a video camera, you better find a way to get that sound of that video camera. I don't care what it is. So that's another great thing. Be open. Don't be so, so thought, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. No, it can be whatever it's going to be. Thank you so much for listening to our All In Podcast. If you enjoy the show, please follow, like, and subscribe on our socials. YouTube, Official Narda Instagram, Official Narda, one word. And All In with Narda Michael Walden on Apple Music, Spotify, and more. Thank you so very much.